My name is Hidayah Salam Asani. I'm president of this uh, non-political, non-religious foundation for science, technology, and civilization. I am a professor of mechanical engineering. I've been a professor of mechanical engineering for years and years in, in Manchester, where I used to be UMIST. But then I moved on, and the moving on is due to a, a, a colleague of mine, late Professor Donald Cardwell. He was a professor of history of science and industry. He came to see me and he said, Salem, you've done very well in your life. You are the top earner in the university and you have so many things that you've done in your life and you've got recognition worldwide and so on. Now, what are you going to do with yourself? I said, what do you mean? He said, look, I've been studying history of science and industry and technology most of my life and I find that there is a gap of about a thousand years missing in the minds of people and so on. And, and I said, yes. Well, he says, this is where the civilization where you come from, because I come from Baghdad, you see. And I said, what do you want me to do? He says, we need to do something about this. It's missing. And I said, me? He said, yes. I said, but I hate history. <laughs> he says, what do you mean? I said, look at the history that I was taught when I was a teenager. It was a history of people killing each other. That's what it was. He said, oh, no, 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 forget about this. It's, they, they use political lens and religious lens when they, when they look at history. What you should do is use the science lens, and then you will see a different world, you see a different one. I said, well, look, I might consider this, but give me some time, like all usual professors, they go and do some sort of searching in the background, employ one or two slaves to do some research and, <laughs> you know, uh, do some surveys in the libraries and, and see whether it is really worthwhile. Is it something there that one can, rather than going to go and get money or get some sort of reputation and recognition, I thought that I discovered something that is really very humanistic there. There's something, he is right, it's missing. And uh, how I really got enthusiastic about this is that I discovered that, uh, in fact, most of the textbooks in schools and, and, and early universities, they have that gap. They have a thousand years missing. And I'll tell you that, how I, you know, I simplify it for you. Just give you an example of a typical popular coffee table book at the time, uh, which claimed to sort of give history of the people who made technology from the earliest times to the present day. Now, of course, this is the first thing that I would go and buy. And I went and then looked up. What it does, it gives names of people, scholars and scientists, each of them given two pages, so that you open it and you look at Pythagoras, you look at you know, people like that, two pages with some pictures. Now, you go to page 14 and you get this. Fine, you know, Archimedes, and uh, he has this period there, now then, 14, I'm not going to show you 15 because it speaks about Archimedes. Let's go to page 16 because it's the next person in chronological order. <laughs> <laughs> I think I have made my point. <laughs> so the guy, Donald, he was right. So I said, he said, look, but what am I going to do? He said, look, you just try to find, you know, I'll help you out. And he did. And he confronted me into, the, uh, there's a society we have for geriatric professors at the time. <laughs> I was the youngest professor. <laughs> and I went and spoke. It's called Manchester Literary and Philosophical Society. And I gave them a few slides. These, in those days, these small little, you know, um, um, carousel slides. I said, what I found here and there. And then everybody who seemed to have really admired that talk at the time. And I thought, my God, you know, I'm like an eye, one-eyed man amongst the blind. <laughs> and so I still continue to be one-eyed man amongst the blind, ever since, unfortunately. And so uh, in summary, what we have in the textbooks of physics, maths, chemistry, biology, engineering, many, many science books, it's STEM subjects, they tend, you know, if you put the names of authors and, and names of laws and theories and so on that are mentioned in those textbooks, put them on a timeline, right? And then you pick them up and you find actually that gap exists. First of all, they're all European Westerners, right? Next, they're all men, right? And it so happened that actually that, it, it's, it's there, it, it's just somehow 
It jumps from the Romans, Greeks and Romans and then jump to the Renaissance. This, this is a huge gap. And, and of course, that was the beginning of people's needing to perceive each other and community relations and international intercultural relations become important. And of course, that's such a big gap that causes problems in the behavior and perception of people. Young people who are not from around here, they will feel inferior. inferior. They have an inferiority complex because they feel that their, their society and their grand 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 assets, they have not contributed to the building of modern civilization. And conversely, a young lad or lasses, to, uh, girl to be brought up from in, in Europe or the United States, and they think that well, she becomes superior in her without realizing this. She, she, she becomes sort of uh, unconsciously s feeling superior because it, this civilization belongs to the you know white-eyed, blue-eyed, blonde, pale-skinned European American you know sort of culture, and this is the way it is presented, unfortunately. But the the, the subliminal message comes to that, and that is that causes a big problem in attention. So I began to be encouraged. Right. And by the way, I put there in red, there is a, a European, there is Europe, which is called Al Andalus, the, the, Liberia, the, 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 the Iberian Peninsula, which is Spain and Portugal, that was Muslim for 750 years. And a huge number of scientists, male and female, emerge from there, and they don't get mentioned in any of those books. So really, the public conscience is imbalanced. And hence, I am encouraged to do this. I don't even charge money for that because I got enthusiastic <laughs> about it. We set up a foundation, and we've got a lot of mad people like myself who feel that this is important, and, and so on. They gave the time. I took early retirement and focused, and then managed to produce um, a number of websites and books and so on in the subject. I got fellowship of the British Science Association, the prestigious one, not because I had been such a... Uh, you know, a successful professor of mechanical engineering, but because I, <laughs> I, I produced some good information on science and Muslim culture. So that, that's the sort of, so I, I'm, when I know walk and go around this, when people come to say to me, oh, 1,000 inventions, you know, they know me as <laughs> what I have done over the last 20 years instead of what I've done in the previous 20 or 30 years. Right, let's just move on. What this misses, is a golden period where people actually, particularly in Baghdad and the days of 1001 nights, right, in those areas of the world, they used to work together. You know, Muslim, Christian, Hindus, uh, Jewish, and so on. And they were, because if they were interested in finding out the truth about nature, and they wanted to apply the, this knowledge into become, making it useful to society. So they were all, you know, men and women as well. I'm, in, in about six months' time, hopefully, I've got a book out, uh, going to be coming out on uh, women of science, uh, medicine, and management in Muslim civilization, because that will shock the Muslims more than the non-Muslims. <laughs> anyway, so this is the sort of picture that used to, sort of used to exist. I've got 600 names in here that need to be given no Nobel Prize, right, some, some, somehow, but they're dead. And there are men, women, Muslim, non-Muslim, all from that period. And, and of course, uh, that period, there is an enormous amount of technology and engineering and science and so on. Because I'm a mechanical engineer, I got interested in bringing out from manuscripts uh, how these machines, which they used to use, and, and make 3D animations out of them. This particular machine is, is a clock, a water clock, that Harun al-Rashid, the caliph of Baghdad, Right, the 1001 invention in the Knights uh, Caliph um, had gifted to Charlemagne, the Holy Emperor of Europe, right, Holy Roman Emperor of Europe, and he was b based in Aachen. And this, uh, we have reworked this out uh, to see how it must have looked out, and, and then and, and made the 3D animation with sound on it. The the French archives talk about what happened at the court. And he, they were all, they ran away. They thought this was some sort of a genie inside because it worked automatically. And it's effectively like a computer. It is really a programmable computer because through using water control system, it tells you on the hour, you get guys coming out on a horse and then a, a ball falls and make, give you a sound and so on. Let's move on very quickly. There was a lot of industry 
and engineering that still exists today from those days, particularly like things like reciprocal pumps like this, which converts the rotational motion into reciprocal motion, right? And then you've got multiple um, pumps like this, driven by cams and connecting rods. It's very similar to what we have today, and that's a, more or less about a thousand years ago. So, and then uh, suddenly we see the United Nations, after a lot of effort, recognizes a year of light, so hence the connection for tonight. And the International Year of Light was 2015. And what we convinced them and had to go and make presentations with professors and so on and so to show that actually what needs to be celebrated is the one who, uh, one guy who was from Basra, who spent most of his life in Egypt and got into prison, is, is the guy who is called the father of optics, al Hassan ibn al-Haytham. So there was, there was a celebration that year and there was an exhibition that was made and it was started from Paris and it went around the world in China, America and so on. So it seems that there is reasonable light at the end of the tunnel. Ibn al-Haytham, who is considered to be the father of optics, is being depicted in all sorts of pictures and so on. So these are, you know, people think of what he must have looked like, right? But he lived in, the, in that period, 19, 965 to 1040. Originally, as I said, from Basra, went into Egypt, he was trying to help the caliph at the time to, convert, to build a dam in, in River Nile. He refused to do the dam because he thought it was going to spoil the, uh, the countryside. And then he ended up into trouble. And, and so Anyway, during his contemplation and uh, in, in house con confinement, he, he thought about how light, how we see. Because in those days, and previous to him, the Greeks and others and so on, they had problem about how does vision take place. I mean, there were a number of uh, theories one of them is that, that there are invisible rays coming out of the eye that shines on the objects, and others speak about some sort of movements in the air. And anyway, he said, uh, uh, and he wrote a book called The Book of Optics, and he explained that light actually is either reflected or emitted from objects, it goes into the eye, and then he described, described also the eye, and, and a very exciting uh, sort of book that became very famous in Europe, and transmitted a lot of information through there. But he is more also known as the father of experimental method because he believe, he says that you know, if you want to investigate anything, you really, as a scientist, you should always consider yourself uh, you know, an, an enemy of that is what is written. You've got to be very critical of what is, uh, what is written. Right? And, 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 and he believed in experimental verification. All theories must be tested by laboratory and so on, and hence he is really considered as the father of experimental method as we know it today. Anyway, he's written a lot of books, uh, 45 books, and mainly in, in, on, on vision, experimental methods, the camera obscura, and then uh, ray theories and so on. So um, he also built, why I got interested in him, he also built a water clock, which uh, was run by water and become recognized uh, by one of the craters on the moon. His carries his name. We call him Al Hazm, right? So that was you know, then we come to the, his period. He was also involved in mathematics and so on because of all this theory that he had. Uh, in his time, there were a lot of interest in mathematics. One of the great guys that we owe a lot to is called uh, Al Khwarizmi, right? And and uh, that's sort of. The, again depicted, even the Russians want to claim him, even, you know, so this is a Russian stamp. Uh, but the name algorithm sort of uh, uh, is, 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 is a distortion of, of his So he has, he has actually one of many mathematicians. The, the, the diagram that you have on the right here is somebody <laughs> thought of some weird idea about that actually those Arabic numerals that were originally Indian, that when came to Baghdad, that they have been converted and morphed into this sort of thing that is actually what you see is the number of angles. So each character shows a number. But this has been disputed, you know. And, and, and in any case, there's a lot of mathematics, a lot of, you know, the guy al me is known to have used the zero as a digit into the system so that it be then started the decimal work, decimal system and so on. He is also, uh, the name of the book that he has written about how to find unknowns it's called Al-Jabr al muqabala and therefore Algebra came from, from, from there. And so, um, you know, this is why I think that he really deserves a great deal 
and of recognition. And the, the zero, which was called sufr in Arabic, has morphed into uh, into Europe as in Italian in a cipher, and then in Spain zero and French zero, and then as we know it today zero. Then we move on to a famous mathematician, but also a philosopher whose name is Al Kindi. He has he was prolific. He's a polymath, and he was uh, originally from Al Kindi tribe, but he was born and lived in in Baghdad in Iraq. He again is depicted in all sorts of uh, ways. So what interests us today is, of course, his, his work on, 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 on decryption. But uh, he also says we should not be ashamed of appreciating the truth of obtaining of wh wherever it comes from, right? Even if it comes from races distant and nations different from us. Thank you, Al-Kindi. I really hope that our course organizers in schools and universities would take advice from this. He reminds me of what uh, uh, Isaac Newton have said. He said, that I've see, if I have seen more than others, it was because I stood on the shoulders of giants, right? You know, we have to appreciate the contributions of our great ancestors from whoever they are. We're all human beings, you know, and, and you cannot confine intelligence to, to one group of some sort of genetic, you know, uh, thing. Right. Now, what, uh, uh, what is relevant to uh, the Alan Turing uh, Institute is, of course, uh, coding, decoding, cryptology, cryptanalysis, and so on. And, and I have discovered that this guy, Al-Kindi, despite the fact that he has written so much on philosophy and, and other uh, subjects, he had developed a technique because at the time, coding was ripe. Because they used to send messages through birds, they sent messages through horses and so on, and they could fall into enemies' hands or the wrong hands. And so a lot of, lot of uh, uh, encryption, you know, a lot, lot of uh, coding was taking place. And he has developed this method of what he called, you know, we now call it frequency analysis. He is just simply what he says that, look, take any language and you look, take some large piece from that language uh, of text and find that from uh, normally, what are the most popular letters? You know, uh, that, that, and in English, I have in here the English is letter E is is most hi the highest in, in in terms of use in normal language. And then you go on to the next and another. And what he does, and then he says, okay, you take one of the uh, decoded messages, one of the coded messages, and then find out and try to replace using those, and then you reduce the number of trials. and And the frequency method actually. Uh, stayed with us for a very long time and in fact it was used I have a feeling it was used by the group and not necessarily by Alan Turing but by the rest of the people because it was quite popular in, in Europe anyway uh, there are experts who like uh, Professor David Kahn who has written a book on the code breakers he says that cryptology was born among the Arabs uh, they were the first to discover and write down the methods of crypt analysis then there is another excellent piece of work, famous Simon Singh. He has written a, the code book. It's, it's a big vol volume on black cover called The Science of Secrecy from Ancient Egypt to, to Quantum Cryptography. He says that Al-Kindi's technique, known as frequency analysis, shows that it is unnecessary to check uh, each of the billions of potential keys. Instead, it is possible to reveal the contents of a scrambled message simply by analyzing the frequency of the characters in the cipher text. So this is the sort of, uh, um, and I have a feeling that someone like Al-Kindi, and if we are talking about diversity and recognition, I think Milton Keynes could take, I have a project for Milton Keynes. <laughs> you could actually raise a flag. <laughs> you can go to the United Nations, like we did with the optics, we say we need a year for coding, code breaking. And when you mention the name Al-Kindi and we can help you to, then we will get this flagship sailing from Milton Keynes. I hope I have entertained you. There is actually this slide which shows that it wasn't originally Isaac Newton who has actually <laughs> coined that phrase. It was Bernard Chartis who, who actually says we are like dwarfs on the shoulders of giants so that we can see more than they. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. I wish your weekend to be a resounding success. <laughs>